I'm Jen Taylor Skinner, and this is The Electorate. On this episode, I have a conversation with Amanda Hunter, the executive director of the Barbara Lee Family Foundation. Amanda joins me to discuss their latest research, which explores how political races change when two women compete. And their findings are really fascinating. And I'll include a link to the research in the show notes. Amanda and I will go over some of the key findings, including the infamous likability test that often comes up when women run for office. And when two women are competing for the same seat, how do voters determine which one they deem more likable? Also, we talk about how race, gender, and partisanship shape a voter's belief about the importance of electing women and people of color. And as more women run for office, we're going to see women running against other women more often. And that is why this research is so important. So please enjoy my conversation with Amanda Hunter of the Barbara Lee Family Foundation. Amanda Hunter, welcome. Thank you. Great to be with you. Thank you for having me. So first of all, when I heard about this new research, I thought it was so fascinating. I really love digging into analyses that, you know, take some common dynamic that we're used to, but looking at it in a different way. And in this case, the Barbara Lee Family Foundation looked at women running for office, but not just women running for office, when women are their opponent is another woman. So when women are competing against one another for an elected position, the first thing I thought of, of course, was the 2020 Democratic primary when we had, I think, the most women in history running for president, right? So why this research? Why do this research now? Thank you. Well, when Barbara started the foundation and started doing research in the late 90s, it was simply about giving women the tools to run for office at all and get women elected maybe for the first time to office, help them understand the landscape. Now we've seen a record number of women elected to office for the past couple of cycles. And more and more, like you've said, we've seen high profile races that are dominated and led by women. Here in Boston, where we're based, We elected our first woman mayor last year, but it was four women who were leading the primary. So things look very different than they did when Barbara started this work. And that is a good thing. That is a sign of progress. I think some research that was done in 2017, I think that was also by the Barbara Lee Family Foundation, that showed that voters were no longer surprised by women running in high profile campaigns. What they were less used to seeing was women running against other women. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah. So we found in this research that voters were not surprised to see women running for office on either side of the aisle, but still thought it was unusual to see women run against other women. And as you said, that is a direct contrast from what we found in 2017. When I first started this work, we found that voters back then thought women were outsiders and were change candidates. They were less used to seeing women on the ballot. So in a relatively short period of time, that is a pretty big change in perception and very positive that now voters are no longer surprised to see women on the ballot. You know, I think that 2017 being that pivotal year is probably obviously related to Hillary Clinton's run. Am I right about that in 2016? I think that definitely contributed to it, but I also think that there is no one thing that caused this confluence of events that we saw ultimately multiple women run for office and a record number of women elected to office. When you think about the 2016 election, you think about the first women's march in 2017, and then the Me Too movement, and just this overwhelming tide of truth telling that came out in this country, and allegations and stories about so many men and people in power. I think all of those things really contributed to women, particularly from other professional backgrounds, giving up their career path and deciding to transition into politics. And it seems like that trend has not really slowed down. No, you're absolutely right. It's easy to forget about how many things happened in the past five, six years. You know, there was Hillary Clinton's run in 2016 and then the Women's March and the Me Too movement, like all of those things that you mentioned. And then we had this kind of cascade of women running and all these powerful women stepping up to lead. It's kind of like a roller coaster. It hasn't stopped. So, but I want to talk a bit about 
partisanship and the role that that plays in voters' beliefs about the importance of electing women, specifically women of color. Did you look at how people responded when two women are running against one another and the importance of whether those women are women of color, you know, based on the voters' party? Yes, we have found for a couple of years throughout our research that one key indicator of whether or not someone is going to vote for a woman is whether or not they believe that women lead differently and serve differently in office. And younger voters, Democrats, and people of color are more likely to believe that women serve differently in office. And overall, people's partisanship has so much influence over their voting decisions. It's very unlikely that someone is going to abandon their party affiliation and vote across the aisle just because someone is a woman. People are usually thinking through the lens of their own political ideology first and then looking at gender. And those two things interact with each other when we look at voter opinion. Are people looking at that differently depending on what party they're in and depending on how the political party responds to wanting more women to run for office? Um, for instance, like the Democratic Party seems to be very into leaning into having more women in leadership positions, specifically women of color, right? You can see that in, you know, President Biden's administration versus the Republican Party is putting kind of less of an emphasis on that, right? So how do the voters respond to the way that the parties are leaning into women and specifically women of color running? Well, I think it's really interesting, Jen, because it's definitely the narrative that the Republican Party and even Republican and independent voters and focus groups will say things like gender doesn't matter, race doesn't matter, it's about the person, this is identity politics if you're saying anything else. But when you look at the people that the Republican Party has been running, I like to think as someone who works to increase women's representation, that the Republican Party has figured out running women is a successful strategy. And when you think about the fact that it was Governor Kim Reynolds, a woman who was chosen to deliver the rebuttal to the State of the Union address, which is a very high profile position to be in, I think that's no accident. Or the fact that a, a woman of color, Kathy Barnett, who we know little about in Pennsylvania, is right now giving Dr. Oz a run for his money in primary in Pennsylvania. So we've seen for years that women have a lot of advantages with voters. And it seems like now both parties are realizing that. But you're right that people talk publicly about it differently. And voters' understanding of their own biases are a little bit different as well. So I know that the research was about how voters responded to women running specifically against other women. And I'm just curious as to whether you think it's fair to say that Democrats running women and, and particularly running women of color, the motivation is different, right? I feel as if, you know, just from an outsider's view, that Republicans seem to run women for office as kind of a, a reactionary campaign, for instance, right? Like it, going back to the 2008 campaign, when Hillary Clinton lost the primary to Barack Obama, you know, following that, John McCain put Sarah Palin on the ticket. And a lot of people felt like that was a reaction to Hillary Clinton losing the primary and then, you know, putting forth a woman on the Republican ticket to appease women who wanted to vote for a woman. Is that a trend that you see or is that a fair assessment of how I'm seeing the Republicans respond to women running on Democratic tickets? I think it's definitely complicated when you look at the opportunities that women have and also in the larger party machinery and the decisions to have women run for different positions. One reason that my boss, Barbara, wanted to start doing this work more than 20 years ago is because in a lot of states, a lot of party officials would give women a chance to run when they knew that the election was doomed, if it was running against an entrenched incumbent, or if it was going to be a really tough race, then they would give the woman her chance and say, okay, now you can be on the ballot when it was a nearly impossible climb. So I think that there definitely have been historically, on all levels, kind of sexist decisions around allowing women to run. But I think one thing that really surprised me about this research is really kind of disappointing, honestly, 
is that we've studied for so long the dynamics of women running against men and always thought, well, if it's two women, it would probably erase some of the gender bias that women face when they run against men. Unfortunately, this research found that it really amplifies a lot of that bias. And that was really surprising to us. Why do you think that is? Are there any clues as to why it's amplifying that? I think it's just an indicator of how much work needs to be done to break down some of these stereotypes. So if a woman runs against a man, we've seen for decades in our research that voters assume that the man is qualified, but the woman has to do much more to convince voters that she's up to the job. So we were surprised to find out in this research when two hypothetical women ran against each other, voters demanded to know why either woman was qualified. So each woman is going to have to work very hard to show voters why she's qualified. That was very surprising to us, but also very helpful for people to know. It's really disheartening to think that women still have to meet higher standards in proving their qualifications, even when there's no man in the race, right? That's really sad. But I'm curious as to if you have two highly qualified women or just two women generally, right? You know, how do two women um, prove their qualifications and what types of qualifications trump the other when two women are facing each other in a, in a race? Well, we found for years and found again here that the economy and budget are typically weak issues for all women. And the economy is also is typically a weaker issue for Democrats. So for Democratic women, because that's sort of two categories with a weakness, that can be a hill that they have to climb. And so this research shows that it's very helpful for any woman candidate to have a detailed economic plan. And also it can be helpful to have validators like a chamber of commerce or a prominent economist validate an economic plan and having specific numbers and showing confidence around the budget is going to be important. And then not so much a policy issue, but again, a sign of gender bias. We found in this research, as we have previously, that voters were very hard on women's appearance. They scrutinized women's clothing and their hair, their tone of voice, their race, and really expect women to look neat and put together at official campaign events. If a woman's just going door knocking or moving about her day, thankfully voters were a little bit more permissive of how put together she had to look. But if something was going to be televised or photographed or put out officially by a campaign, there was no patience for things like wrinkles on the collar or flyaway hair. And think about someone like Senator Bernie Sanders, who is revered for being kind of frumpy. <laughs> Women don't have that luxury and definitely not now. I'm glad you mentioned that example, because as you were telling me that I, and I was trying to think of any male candidate that was kind of like frumpy and not put together because, you know, they pretty much are generally pretty polished, you know, but I'd forgotten about Bernie Sanders and that infamous photo of him sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And his parka and his mittens, right? Like <laughs> and that became a meme and people thought that it was adorable. And I think one reason too that it's harder to think of a man that doesn't look put together is because men can just throw on a suit and tie. And it's less difficult to have to worry about doing men's hair typically with the stereotypical men's haircuts. So women definitely have to put in the time. And we know time is money on the campaign trail. So if someone is changing in the backseat of a car to go to the next appearance, it's really important to make sure that the time is good put in to steam their jacket and make sure that it's tailored and make sure that they have a necklace. Even though it sounds really trivial, we know this is important to voters when it comes to assessing women. Okay, so speaking of appearance, um, one factor is, of course, age. Did you dig into how age factors into how voters, you know, grade women when two women are running together. I was thinking also, again, I can't get the 2020 primary out of my head, but you know, there's a whole range of ages on the stage for the women. You know, I think Tulsi Gabbard was the youngest, possibly, and I think Elizabeth Warren was the oldest. But, you know, in between you had, you know, mothers, grandmothers, you know, how do voters view women's appearance in relation to age or just age generally? Women face ageism in addition to sexism unfortunately. And voters, I think, have a very I'll know it when I see it kind of attitude. So for 
Some images that we tested, they wanted to make sure that women looked, quote, old enough to be experienced enough to be qualified for the job. But of course, if a woman looked, quote, too old, then they thought that she should step aside in favor of the next generation. And Governor Janet Mills of Maine actually talked about this in the 2018 campaign. She had a lot of experience in the Maine state legislature and then as attorney general of Maine. And she said that for years, she was told, just get more experience, just get more experience. And then she did. And I guess she heard from some people, maybe high up in the party, that she should step aside for someone else. And she was too old and not exciting enough. And she joked and said, I'm experienced, damn it, in a New York Times article. But that is really indicative of what women are facing when you think about the sexism and ageism. We hear from a lot of women just anecdotally when we present our research that voters tell them all the time, oh, you look so young. And they don't say that to men. Men are treated as rising stars if they're young. Think of someone like Secretary Pete Buttigieg. He was celebrated in the 2020 primary for being younger and being earlier in his career. And I don't think a woman would have that same luxury if she had the same resume and age at the time. Right. I'm thinking of O'Rourke, right? Another one who was pretty young. Yeah. Exactly. You know, these biases just mirror the biases that women run into every day in their professional lives, even if they aren't running for office. So that's kind of, again, disheartening. Do these sentiments among voters change based on the race of the voter? Yes. We found in other research and a little bit here as well that voters of color are generally more likely to appreciate the importance of electing women and electing women of color. And we found in in other research that voters of color were also more likely to acknowledge that women face sexism and probably because voters of color are more likely to have faced racism and other discrimination and are more likely to acknowledge that those things exist. So it definitely matters. And we tell candidates when we do informational research briefings and back in the day when we used to speak at conferences in person to really know your electorate, because that will give people a sense of the priorities of the voters that they are trying to win over. I think one of the findings was that voters broadly said that they didn't believe gender had an impact on a candidate's ability to govern, but it wasn't true for AAPI voters, Black voters, Indigenous voters, and younger voters. That's right. I think one other thing that we always point out is when voters say that gender doesn't have an impact, then when you start talking to them, you find out that the odds are they don't really believe that. They might think they believe that, but they're not really aware of their own gender bias either. So that's why focus groups are so helpful for us to get that real qualitative information. So tell me about what you found in relation to likability, because that always comes up in relation to women. And it's kind of an easier thing to gauge how voters will feel when a woman is running against a man, because you know she'll have to prove her likability at a higher standard than a man would. What about when you have two women running against one another? We found that in this research, similar to our other research, women still face the double bind, we call it, of having to be seen as qualified and likable. And if voters don't think a woman is qualified, then they won't like her. But if a woman seems too likable, then voters might not think that she's qualified. So it's a real high wire act that women face. And that, unfortunately, still showed up in this research. Women had to be both qualified and likable. And we found when we tested different debate scenarios that voters were surprised to see women, quote, go negative against each other, even though a political debate is contrasting with their opponent. And so there are still deeply held stereotypes about how men and women in politics act. And with two women in the race, the first woman to go negative or say something that's perceived as an attack might pay a price with voters. Right. So that's one way that voters are defining likability is if a woman goes negative, right? So what happens when a man goes negative? How is he viewed? Voters respect it when a man goes negative, and I'm sure you've heard people 
and everybody, all your listeners have heard people before say that a man is tough or he's standing up for his beliefs or if he's yelling or acting like a hothead that that's okay, that's just who he is. Women don't have that luxury. So women have to show that they're strong enough and they have to demonstrate strength but they still have to maintain their likability. And that is a very fine line. Right. You know, I'm thinking about some of the criticisms I've heard of women when they aren't being negative, right? If they're too kind of jovial, they're like too unserious, right? So it it really is a double bind. Absolutely. And that is even what we have found previously around appearance too. The voters want women to look neat and put together and dress well. But if women are dress too well, or if it looks like women are paying too much attention to their appearance, then voters think that they're probably not spending enough time working and might not think that they're qualified. So everything is just so amplified when you look at the scrutiny women face. And interestingly, in this research, voters really inferred a lot of meaning into things in the background of photos in a way that we haven't seen before. And I think that that has to do with the Zoom and TikTok world that we're in now. People assume that everything is curated, even if something just happens to be in the background by mistake or without really any thought behind it. You mean curated in in a way that the photo is manipulated or what do you mean? No, if we tested a photo where someone was in an office and had a computer behind her and people got really hung up on why is that there? What does that mean? And like, nothing. It's a computer. But I think because everything is so curated just in our life, people are now thinking things are curated that aren't. So candidates need to really think carefully if they're putting images out about what is in the background and make sure that nothing's going to be misinterpreted or something. It kind of ends up being curated. (laughs) Yeah, I guess in the end it does. I guess I was thinking, the reason I was asking that question is because I was thinking that I know there's a lot of scrutiny about women in relation to how they present in a familial context, right? You know, whether they have photos of their kids or whether they're, you know, they take campaign photos with their kids or with their community because there's this kind of gendered expectations around women being caretakers. So that's what I was actually thinking. Absolutely. And we may have touched on this before briefly, but we've done research previously that found that for women that have young children and are running for office, voters worry that she won't be able to balance caring for her children and doing the job. But for women who don't have children, voters worry that she may not be in touch with their lives. And in those focus groups, voters admitted that women were held to a different and higher standard and then went on to hold women to a different and higher standard. So that's a place where opinion has not shifted as much as you would expect. So what are some um, real life examples you can think of that are in the upcoming midterms that we should watch out for? So in Arizona, there is a possibility that we could have two women in the general election for governor. Carrie Lake, who is a Trump endorsed Republican, is potentially, if she makes it through the primary, going to run against current Secretary of State Katie Hobbs, who is favored to win the Democratic nomination. So that's something to watch, definitely. And in Iowa, Deirdre DeGier, who is a Democrat, is running a competitive campaign against Kim Reynolds, who I mentioned had given the State of the Union rebuttal. And Iowa is solid red and full show that Reynolds has a solid lead. But this is still going to be one to watch in terms of the general. And then here in Massachusetts, we have two women vying for the Democratic nomination in the primary, Mara Healy and Sonia Chang-Diaz. And in Oregon, it's a very crowded field right now because current Governor Kate Brown is term limited. But Speaker of the House Tina Kotek appears to be a strong contender for the Democratic nomination. And on the Republican side, Christine Drazan is running as a Republican. So at the gubernatorial level, those are just a few examples. There could be a number of women v. women matchups to see this research play out in real time. Is that an unusual number of women versus women matchups that in the years that you've kind of paid attention to this or? It seems like it at the gubernatorial level because women are so underrepresented as, as we talked about before. So even if there end up only being a handful after primaries, that's still statistically pretty high. Longtime Senator Patty Murray, who is often referred to as the most powerful Democratic woman senator, 
has a Republican opponent named Tiffany Smiley. And that's an interesting one because Patty Murray was famous for the story about when she initially went to run for office, she visited her elected official and he said, well, you know, you're just a mom in tennis shoes. And she made that her rallying cry. She's always been the mom in tennis shoes. Now she's a grandma. Well, Tiffany Smiley is a mom. She's a different generation and she's using that in her campaign. So it's interesting to see the dynamics play out in that campaign when it goes to the general. Yeah, that's my state. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Well, Tiffany Smiley is interesting because she is the wife of a retired military official who I believe was wounded in combat. And she does a lot of public appearances. She has a lot of experience in the media. So I think that even though Washington is a blue state, she is a formidable challenger in terms of the attention that she will likely get. And we probably will see some of the dynamics play out that we were talking about in terms of the sexism around women going negative and some of those reactions. And we also saw that in the 2020 debate primaries too, when someone like Senator Klobuchar was held to a different standard for standing up for herself or Vice President Harris as well when men are more celebrated for the same kind of performance. So what did the research reveal about incumbents? So when you have two women running against one another and one is an incumbent, what do voters deem most important in those races? Well, you know what was so interesting about this new research, and it was a big change, is that in 2017, we found that voters really wanted to hear a woman's personal story They were open to hearing about her lived experience. And we would always tell people, of course, lead with qualifications because you have to credential yourself, but then tell voters who you are. Now voters really want issue position. I think because we're in such a polarized, chaotic moment in the world that people want issue positions. They want issue expertise. Then they want experience and credentialing. And then they want to know a woman's background and bio story. So things that tested really well, even recently, like being able to talk about overcoming an obstacle, which even last year was something we saw was popular with voters, was has been deprioritized because people really want to know where do you stand on the issues? How much do you know about the issues? So is there a difference in what issues they're interested in, in a woman having, you know, higher qualifications in versus a man? For instance, I think there was something in your findings that showed that they expected women to have higher qualifications in relation to, or more knowledge rather, in relation to education, right? Or, you know, reproductive rights. Is that something that you found? There are definitely issues that traditionally voters have assumed are stronger for women. And we've seen this in a bunch of different research projects, but certainly in the latest, voters tend to think that women are better on things like education, as you mentioned, or healthcare. And they they traditionally believe that women are more compassionate. And so it kind of goes along with some of those issues. In this research, they also thought that women would be better on abortion. And they actually rated a Republican woman ahead of a Democratic man on the issue. And I would be interested to see if that's changed since the recent developments with the leaked Supreme Court opinion. But women definitely do better on issues that typically seem more to be kind of empathy issues, whereas men are seen to be stronger on things like national security, the economy anything that has to do with guns. And those are gender stereotypes that we really haven't seen change much in our decades of research. Since more Americans support abortion remaining legal, how would that play out, do you think, with two women on the ticket in their positions on abortion? If a Democratic candidate supported reproductive rights, versus, you know, a conservative woman on the ticket who didn't support that, would that play more into the Democratic woman's favor? You know, we haven't looked at that specifically. I know a lot of people are are interested in this question right now. And I also think that there's so much happening in this country when you think about the 
the economy and inflation and all of these other issues that we have to see where those priorities are. I will tell you that in a study that we did with our partners at American University recently, there was a lack of trust in the Supreme Court as an institution. This was before the opinion leaked and that women were generally feeling exhausted and burned out. So certainly we saw a lot of engagement this weekend across the country with women showing up at marches in major cities everywhere. And I think if those women stay activated and are able to overcome the exhaustion and burnout that women have been facing post pandemic, women are going to once again be a very formidable group of voters in the midterms. Yeah, that's my biggest biggest takeaway from this research, which again, I think is really fascinating. And I'm, I'm glad you, you did this, is that as we see more women run for office, we'll see more races where women are running against other women. And it's an opportunity or a chance for us to get ahead of our biases. But I'm also a little bit skeptical that we can do that in the short term, given that a lot of the gender biases are still showing up, the same biases that show up when women run against men. What's the biggest takeaway you think that we should all get from that? Is this a message to the media to get ahead of these biases or like what should we extrapolate from this? I think it's a message to all of us. It is a good thing ultimately when we see multiple women running it helps to break down the stereotypes that people have about women, even if they still hold them in the moment. Because when you think about something like a debate with multiple women, if the stereotype is that women are sort of more of a soap opera cat fight scenario, being able to see as we did in the 2020 Democratic primaries that women might disagree on some issues and then they might agree on other issues. They may contrast with each other one moment, and then they may support each other and lift each other up another moment. All of those things break down those long-held stereotypes. And we like to think, just because my boss, Barbara, always we always try to find the positive, especially in such dark moments that we can have lately, that having more women run is going to break down a lot of those stereotypes, whether or not they get elected. Just seeing multiple women, different backgrounds, women of color on a debate stage or out on the campaign trail is going to eventually change the face of leadership, I hope. But man, is it discouraging sometimes to read about the gender bias in the meantime. Yeah, I mean, the thing that keeps coming to mind is... 2024 for me, right? Because there is not necessarily there's an assumption, but there's a possibility that Kamala Harris could run in 2024, or if Biden doesn't run again, or does run again, rather, in 2028, you know, because that's often the trajectory of a vice president. It's a little worrying, right, that these biases have not lessened. Well, I think when you look at Vice President Harris, so much of the criticism that she has faced is along the lines of what we found people still believe about women because at the root of a lot of the criticism even if it is completely foolish like she laughs too much or is she too warm or she didn't seem so focused during her press briefing or anything else the gnawing sort of undercurrent there that is damaging is the implication that she doesn't belong there, that she's an interloper and that she's not qualified. And that's what I see when I see a story that's supposed to be, oh, it's just in good fun. We're just talking about her laugh, but we talked about George W. Bush's smirk, so it's fair. But it's different because men are able to laugh things off and overcome perceived gaffes. And women have this undercurrent that is, is saying underneath, she doesn't belong here. And that's what, unfortunately, I think VP Harris faces a lot. And that's what I think we all need to look closely at when it happens and call out because things aren't going to change at the highest level unless we have different conversations than we did previously, like in 2016, when, or even in the 2020 primary, when women were running at the very top. One thing I've noticed just anecdotally when women run for office is that these sexist views often creep into the discourse among liberals and progressives, right? And women, you know, I guess you'd call it internalized bias. 
Um, and sometimes it's harder to combat because there's this assumption that one side views women in leadership positions more favorably than conservatives, right? And that they're kind of immune to having these biases. And I think I find that probably the most disheartening. Oh, absolutely. And people do that all the time. And then you think back to things like Dan Quayle not being able to spell the word potato when he was vice president. That's what we're up against here. So I appreciate the work that you and so many other women do on podcasts and in the media to call attention to this bias, because like you said, it's really easy for people to slip into those tropes. And I just have to add that women can be just as bad as men with this internalized misogyny when these types of conversations happen. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And thank you for doing this research. And thank you for mentioning, you know, one of the reasons I do this. I mean, I do it because I just want people to get used to hearing expertise. I mean, any topic that you can find a man to be an expert on, you can find a woman. And that's the whole purpose of the podcast, right? Absolutely. And you've probably heard other journalists have told me that when they call sources, women who are very accomplished will always say, I don't know if I know enough. I don't know if I'm as much of an expert. And they don't typically hear that from men. So there still are a lot of a lot of gender bias in a lot of different industries around the world that hopefully people can look at this research and see how it applies in their own field because I think it applies to women in business a lot of times. Well, thank you so much for your work on this. I hope everything goes well in the midterms and um, yeah, let me know when you have more research. So thank you again. Will do, thank you so much. This is great.